Hello and welcome back to the GamesIndustry.biz Investment Summit Online, sponsored by Exola and Renaissance PR. Uh, next, we have a panel, Don't Do This, Worst Practice for Pitching, with a distinguished lineup of industry guests. Uh, if you have any questions, this is live, so please pop them into the YouTube chat uh, and uh, we'll try to answer them a bit later on. Okay, I'll now pass you over to the host of the panel, Matt Handrahan from GamesIndustry.biz. Over to you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. As uh, Jamie said, I'm Matt Handrahan. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of GamesIndustry.biz. Thanks for coming along to the Investment Summit Online. This is our second of the year. Um, our panel today is going to be about pitching. As the title suggests, we're going to be looking at things that go wrong, mistakes people make, things people overlook. Obviously, we don't want to be purely negative. I think by looking at the negative, you get to illuminate the positive a lot of the time. You get to understand what should be done by focusing on what doesn't get done. I mean, to help me do this, because I'm certainly no well, I received many pitches, but of a very different kind to my to my guests here today. Uh, joining me, I'm going to say all of your names. So if everybody could just give give the crowd a wave when I say who say who you are. We have Troy Horton, who's head of product acquisitions at Team Seventeen. Hi. We have oh hello hello Troy. We have uh, Des Gale, who um, is a is a industry veteran, I would say, currently working with fellow traveller, which is a very interesting publisher based in Australia, if memory serves me correctly. We have Ella Romanos, uh, founder of Fundamentally Games. There we go. And finally, last but not least, we have Zach Antonacci, the head of publishing at Frontier Development. Um, so basically, I'd like everybody to give, what I think is, because obviously pitching goes on every day in, a, in an all manner of circumstances in the games business. I think it would really help people understand who you are, what you do specifically, and the kind of pitches you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's listening to them, help, helping people to prepare them. Because obviously, everything from a AAA game to a bedroom code project is pitched at some level. So perhaps we should start with uh, who I introduced first. Troy, could you give, give people a bit on your background and then kind of what the sort of pitches you're dealing with day-to-day -day at Team 17? Well, um, very briefly, I've uh, been in the industry 28 years. I started at a studio called Core Design in Derby um, in development. Uh, I worked on the first five Tomb Raider games, established my own studio after that, um, which grew to about 250 people in Shanghai. Uh, came back to England in 2018 and started at Team 17. So very much a mixture of business and development background, which I think um, certainly helps my job. Uh, when looking for independent developers and um, trying to get them signed to the Team 17 label. And that's what I do at Team 17 is, um, it, you know, it's a very much a multi-department effort, but our role is to find great developers with great games with a commercial opportunity. Yeah, sure. Um, so Ella, games... Ella. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you, you, you go, you go, you go. Yeah, so just to answer the final question, what kind of games we look for, what kind of games we get pitched, um, and what kind of developers, it's very much a, a wide range from a single per person studio, the other side of the world, up to large scale teams. We are very much focused on the independent developer scene of a certain scale rather than AAA. Uh, we are genre agnostic, so we look at everything, um, as long as it's premium PC, VCM, or console. So that's really where our focus is. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Ella, would you mind uh, telling us a bit about your background, what you currently do with Fundamentally? And I mean, I know you, and, and like the kind of pitches you deal with, where you kind of fit into that process. Sure. So, yes, I'm the CEO of Fundamentally Games. Um, prior to that, my background originally programming and primarily for the last 12 years running studios and projects. Um, but particularly for the last five or six years, I've worked with a lot of finances to provide funding, uh, mainly on the equity and debt side. And I've also worked with a lot of developers to actually help them to raise money. Um, nowadays, I'm focused on fundamentally games. We work with devs to provide live ops specifically. Um, that does include helping them to raise funding, in particular UA funding and support on the sort of commercial aspects of games as a service, so monetization, retention, market feasibility. Um, so I'm reviewing a lot of pictures every week at the moment, uh, usually in terms of what we're seeing, uh, small developers up to sort of medium size, uh, a lot of startups 
um, also some more experienced teams, uh, all of whom are making games as a service, primarily on PC or mobile. And we're looking at pictures from every stage from concept through to games that are already live. Okay, so good, good range of experience there. And again, a bit of crossover there with what Troy was saying, small to mid-sized developers. I know Team 17 goes a bit bigger than that, but there's some crossover there. Des, would you like to do the same for, for the audience listening? Give yourself a bit, of, a bit about your background and also like what you're dealing with in terms of receiving pitches on day-to-day -day fellow traveler. Yeah, cool, yeah. Um, so my, uh, my background is similar to Troy's. Um, I'm just not as old. Um, Yes, I've done a lot of uh, development side. <laughs> um, uh, so Fair Traveller would be the yeah second publisher I work for. So, um, yes, yeah, so I look after production, and whereas um, receiving pitches mm -hmm. and scouting isn't my primary role, like all the management team are involved in doing that. Um, and then I guess Fair Traveller, so we're a label that um, we publish innovative story games. And we're looking for for developers that uh, are working cool, interesting experiences with narrative at their core. So um, it's very specific, which is great for us because you know there's loads of people who want to make games, right? So there's lots of pictures flying around, mm -hmm. but um, ours if it need to be in that narrative niche. Um, so specifically, what I do is because uh, we're all a remote team. Um, depending on who's closest to the event, it's a bit of a moot point now that we're digital, but let's call it time zone, I guess. Um, they're the, the person that kind of interacts with that event and receive those pitches. Um, and then once we take those pitches back to the management team, uh, my primary role is to just speak to developers, do due diligence. They have to convince me that they can make the game um on time for the money that they want from us uh if they require investment um and then once we sign them it's just all about coaching them to the finish line basically and solving problems for them yeah well i think that the specificity of fellow traveler is actually quite an important thing we're going to return to across the the, the course of this of this session here but before we move on to the body of it zach uh, you're you're last on the list here do, do, do the, the audience the, the pleasure of knowing a little bit more about what you do and, again, kind of the kind of pitches you're dealing with on a regular basis. Sure. So um, I'm going to have to apologize. I have to put my, my headset on so you'll get to see that lovely, lovely uh, headset and microphone that I'm using just to stop the feedback. But, uh, yeah, so my name is Zach Antonacci. I'm the director of publishing at Frontier. Um, in terms of my history, I've been in the games industry for about 15 years now. Um, started off uh, and and a large amount of that in in community management and community building and then sort of more wider into the sort of marketing and publishing uh, and communications areas um in terms of frontier for those of you who don't know uh frontier are a, a 500 plus person studio based in cambridge in the united kingdom um they are uh we make titles develop titles as well as publish them probably best known for Elite Dangerous, Planet Coaster, Jurassic World Evolution, and um, Planet Zoo. Um, and so uh, obviously continue to do that, but we also, uh, part of my role is working with uh, and finding other developers from around the world as part of our, our Frontier Foundry games label. So looking at studios anywhere from small, um, small sort of three person teams up to sort of much larger um, development studios. And we sort of work across primarily PC and console, but uh, we sort of work across a, a range of genres and a range of um, studio sizes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, to, to when I was thinking about how to structure this, I kind of broke down the pitching process into four stages. Um, again, I'm not the expert on pitching here, but I think it kind of roughly coheres to, to the way that people should be approaching this research, the pitch deck, the meeting, and following up. I thought it'd be interesting to kind of break it down like that so we could look at the mistakes that get made along the path, you know, along the complete journey of, of finding a publisher, pitching to a publisher, and then kind of what happens after that finishes. I just like to take the opportunity at this point to remind people, you know, don't be afraid to 
throw questions down uh, under the YouTube. We have got people looking to pick them up. There's a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge here that you can tap into. And certainly it shouldn't be me asking all of the questions because this could be one of the most practically useful to topics that we deal with today. You could really leave with like a much better footing, I think, as a result of this. Uh, but to get started, so research. I mean, research in my job is enormously important. I don't, don't go into any interview, any meeting without really looking at who I'm talking to, trying to understand who they are, what they need, what they want, what they've done in their past, and so on and so forth. I do wonder, how, what role does research play in pitching, I would say? And are there areas that tend to get overlooked by developers that, that, that you think are important to understand going in? Okay, who's going to go first? Oh, it's a free for all. Who 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 wants okay. to? Zach, you seem. Well, I, yeah, well, I, I biggest thing for me that I, I I think is important is know your audience. Um, you know, a lot of developers they are highly skilled at what they do, which is creating a game. You know, whether it's programming, code, art, design, you know, whatever skill set uh, the person in in particular is is pitching. Uh, but knowing your audience is really important. Um, there can be no success without understanding your audience and understanding your game. Now, we get pitched a lot of games, and a lot of them are me too, and a lot of them are, you know, probably nobody would ever publish, unfortunately. Um, so understanding your game is knowing its unique selling point. A genre, for example, is not a unique selling point. You know, it's a Metroidvania. It's not a unique selling point. Oh, it's like Fortnite. That's not a unique selling point. Um, you know, what value does that have to the player that's playing your game? Um, so differentiating your game, identifying its USP, and, um, you know, that, that actually does take research. Um, and from that, you can actually understand who is your audience, who you're targeting. Uh, because, you, you know, one of the, the greatest things for uh, a publisher to see is consumer buy-in on a product even before it's released. You know, there is a lot of strength in that, actually. Um, you know, how many Twitter followers you've got, uh, you know, how, what engagement do you get from your tweets, how many wish lists do you have, um, you know, how many followers on Steam. This is all really important. And I think this is perhaps one of the best things that a developer can do um, going to a publisher because you've got something in your hand that has a lot of strength. And something that you can start a, a very strong discussion with straight away. That's just mm -hmm. uh, my perspective. You know, they're good at their things. Focus on your things. You come into a publisher for other things. They're the expert in those areas. Yeah. I mean, how much do you expect developers to have that broader understanding of the market? Like do proper market research to so not become too entrenched in their own game and what it is. But actually understand, I have done the research to display that they know where it fits. I think on a, on a personal level, um, first of all, I have to agree with everything that was just said. I think that was really, um, really, really good uh, advice. I also think that at its core, see, the, one of the things for us is that development teams and, and publishing teams you know, ultimately have to work together uh, extremely closely. And it's, it's really important that the, the core principles that, that Troy was just mentioning there are, are ingrained within development at the very, very start. So, you know, if you know who you're trying to make a game for, if you know what type of game that you're trying to make and you know what your, your USP is, that should be at the very heart of, of the game that you're making as well. So I, I do think that that's super, super important. And the other thing to mention, I think all of that that research is really, really good as well. The other thing probably to, to mention in terms of research is also uh, to research the, the, the publishers or the partners that you're looking to work with and that you're having conversations with because I think it's really important to, you know, ultimately for any developer, that is a partnership and, and you're working very much in partnership with, with any publisher or, or any other partner. And it's really, really important to make sure that, you know, you understand as much as you can about, about everything uh, within that partnership to be able to, to make sure that everyone's working on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, um, they're, yeah. You go. You go. You go. Uh, well, I would start to say I agree with everything. I think, um, in general, you know, my my perception of most pictures I see is that they are far too much based on opinion rather than evidence and external validation. Um, and obviously, you, getting users before you know the game is launched is, is a really good way to do that. But there are other ways, which is research and market data. Um, and I think you know 
one particular thing I see with audience is that it sometimes feels like the game has been designed because it's what the developer wants to make and then they've tried to attach an audience to it. And this often comes across when it's worded things like, my audience is 80 for 18 to 35 year old men. Um, mm -hmm. That's not an audience because it's not targetable. And this is kind of the, for me, that is my absolute pet peeve. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, it feels like you need to be designing a game that's for an audience need. Therefore, your audience and your market is part of the entire design process. A designer must care about their audience and market, it's not a, just a publisher's job, which I think is some perception of what the audience and market is. You are designing a game for people and therefore your uh, everything you do, every decision you make in your entire process should be about what that audience wants. And I think that where I do see pictures where that happens, it's very clear. But I would say that it is very, very rare for me to see a pitch that really does that. Mm, interesting stuff. I mean, Des, uh, I, this talk about sort of specific, like understanding the publisher themselves, the person you're talking to, really, that seems to apply to fellow traveller quite heavily because, as you were saying at the start, you're really only looking for one kind of game. Do you encounter a lot of pitches where people don't bring that knowledge with them, that, that they don't seem to understand what fellow traveller actually does, don't realise that they're not going to fit? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, every day. And, yeah, it's a, yeah, I kind of want to jump on Zach's point there about knowing the publisher um, and even double down on that. Like, especially with these online platforms now, you can even find out who it is from the publisher you're going to be speaking to um, because... I think for a developer, your goal is is when you're trying to get some publishing deal, like you need to find an internal champion, right? So if you can tap into um, some of the biases that the actual person that you're speaking to has, like that's going to help you when they're pitching the game internally because they're going to be a bit more enthusiastic about it. Um, but yeah, like research uh, from a publisher level, like I think nowadays, like this wasn't always true. Like maybe even as recent as five years ago, like we were quite walled off, like, you know, not very accessible and like no one would know what we want. But like, I think now, like especially everyone here anyway, that I, I've seen, um, we're all super open. It's like, yeah, don't come and talk to us about this stuff. We are interested in this stuff. This will make our lives much easier and it will annoy us if you don't even just click on the first page of our website um and then i just wanted to touch on the market research so from my perspective um like data is really hard to come by um so whenever i see stuff in slides it's 99 percent wrong but what's important to me is the method behind the madness like why you think those numbers are okay like if you could explain that to me like that goes a long way rather than numbers being accurate um yeah, no, I think it's, it's interesting there that, that the takeaway there does seem to be that realistically you should be thinking about this kind of stuff way before a pitch is even on the table, right? Like you need to be thinking about your market, your player from the first days of your projects. And so by the time you end up with a pitch or a pitch to prepare for you, you kind of already have a good sense of that stuff, which is which is interesting. Um, with, the, with the pitch deck, I mean, I know that obviously this is more... It was more like a detail in some ways. And I did, I think I guess, I guess the first point here is like, how important is the pitch deck to you in terms of how you relate to the game, how, how impressed you're likely to be by what they're kind of putting in front of you? I mean, anyone can go first on that. Pitch deck's pretty important. Um, it's what I typically do or what I typically want from a pitch deck is just clear concise details single or two page a document you know explaining what the game is what's unique about it um, a little bit about the developer and more importantly what their needs are mm -hmm. um, because for every pitch I go into um, I want to make or I need to make an action step because it's really about the greeting the understanding and they're figuring out what to do next. Um, because every developer, if they have something to show and they put time, effort, and probably money in their own pocket uh, to create, and many developers don't have a great deal of money in their pocket, you know, um, which I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows, it's important they're not lost down a rabbit hole. So for, for me, the pitch, clear, concise details, very short, ending the pitch with a action step to make as in 
you know, for example, for us, we have a process explaining what that process is, what's going to happen and when it's going to happen importantly. Um, so it's really just the detail to, to, to set the ball rolling, um, to make sure that the action step is based on us actually being interested in what they're pitching. Those key points, the game name, the pitch, uh, the, the genre, um, you know, how much money do they need? If they've got that money, when are they going to get it finished? You know, the unique selling point, single sentence, um, just that kind of basic detail. That's, I think, is the most critical point, what I look for anyway. Interesting. So that, so please continue. No, so I, I mean, for me, say, I think oh. it's... No, no, go for it. <laughs> Let's go to Ella first. And then we'll go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say, you know, I think um, the pitch deck is important. I mean, ultimately, the game itself is the most important. But for us, certainly, you know, and particularly when I've been looking at things with finances, but equally when we're looking at, you know, for people to work with, you know, we need to know that you understand the goals of your own project. Um, and frankly, we're all here to make money, whether that's to grow as big as Supercell or whether that's just to make enough money to make your next game. We're all here to make money. And so understanding what your expectations are is really important. So, you know, yes, it's great if a pitch deck is really well laid out and it makes it as easy as possible. But fundamentally, there's certain information I need. Um, and the things that, you know, are usually missing in most cases for me are revenue forecasts. Um, how you will fund yourself post-launch uh, and any consideration for budget and process after that. And this one always surprised me, which is what Troy said, that most decks don't actually say what they want and what they need. I um, Just before this, uh, for this for the panel, I actually looked back at the decks that I reviewed over the last two to three weeks. I've reviewed 17 decks and only two of them had uh, anywhere close to the amount of information that I need on the commercial side. Most mm. of them were lacking in almost everything. So just to give you a kind of scale of, of how common it is to not see these things. Interesting. Is that is that a common experience for say you, you Zach? Um, I don't know if, if the same percentages maybe. I think we, we generally I generally see more um, that that certainly have a, a level of, of kind of what they want. But I do absolutely agree that that what's required to be able to bring that game uh, and, and release it is is vitally important. Uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, concise as well as Troy said is 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 very very key. Um, the, the question of kind of is is the the pitch deck and is that pitch meeting kind of um, how how much importance does it have for me? That's the shop window. That's the opportunity to really sell um, kind of the concept behind it, but in a in a really clear, concise way, so that you know that whoever it is that you're you're you're, you're talking to can kind of get all of the information that they need. They can easily come back with those questions, and it's it's only the start of a process, you know. And and what's really going to tell is whether is things like like you know, uh, if there's a build, how how you know can you find the fun in that build, or is there you know does does the studio have a track record of making games, and and how does you know how does that sort of sit in terms of their experience? All of those things come into it, but it, it, it's it's only the start of the process. It's usually, especially if you're something like the the, the investment summits, you know, and, and stuff like that. Then then these meetings are very very short. Don't take up the full twenty minutes of it. You know, allow some time for conversation. Try and get your point in in in. You know, within that sort of maybe ten-minute window, keep it nice and kind of clear and concise, but 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 get that relevant information in there. So yes, absolutely, the the commercial concepts, but also uh, the USP, as, as Troy was saying, etc., is all very very important. Yeah. Yeah. So I want. Oh, sorry, I think, you uh, go there. Yeah. I, I think a, a common theme I want to touch on here is that um, essentially any de developer will need like multiple versions of a pitch deck. Um, I'm a massive fan of the two pager, um, but they're at different stages, right? So if I use, say, maybe this event as an example, if you're going to send me a meeting request, like you're probably going to want to send me the two pager, and I'm like, eh, can we afford it? Is it is it narrative? All right, cool, I'll have a chat with you. And then, like as Zach just said, like you need probably a, like a five page version that you can talk about really quickly, and then you could be like, okay, cool, I like you, like the team, send me more information. And then you need to send a deck that's maybe 10 or 15 pages that you won't be able to present. It just needs to be read by people. 
um, that has all the information we need. And, and don't forget, like that's the main deck because I don't want to have to explain your game to the rest of the management team. I just want to go click, click here, read that, watch this video, here's the build. So the easier you make that for everybody uh, by having these different versions of your deck, um, you, you, it, it will help you pitch faster and save more time. Um, and then also on top of that, you don't need different versions of every single one, but you need a different version depending on who you're talking to. So if you're speaking to a platform holder, you should have a different deck. You speak to a publisher, a different deck. If you speak to an investor, it's a different deck. Um, and even on the investment level, if it's project funding or uh, company funding, like they're two different decks. So like it, it, there's a lot of work you got to do depending on who you're talking to. But um, it, it will... It, what I say to developers is you want to get to know as fast as possible. Like, don't send us through 10 email chains to get all the information we need just for us to say no. It's like, right, that's everything. All right, we're out. Like, and the thing is, we'll remember that. So when you come to us next time with something, like, oh, yeah, this kid was really good, um, you're going to get an extra 10 minutes from me reading something. Yeah. yeah so just, just to... No, you're Sorry if I may. Please. About the, no, no, you all. know, different desks. Uh, pitch decks, uh, which Des mentioned, and also um, somebody mentioned um, about researching the publisher you're talking to. Everybody has different requirements when you they submit their game to a publisher or an investor, like Des said. You know, for example, um, it was mentioned. You know, many uh, decks don't have forecasting. Um, you know, it's important for some companies. Actually, really important for some companies to see that. For us, it's not very important. It's all about the game, the quality of the game, because we have a sales team, we have an analytics team. That's their area of expertise. And, you know, a lot of developers don't know how to do that. And if they do that, sometimes they either go too little just to sustain a lifestyle, which is no good for us who want to make money. You're right, we do want to make money. And then the opposite end of the scale, you get those that are too enthusiastic and go fortnight with their forecasts. And no one, <laughs> frankly, sits in the Goldilocks zone when it comes to forecast, you know, that just right number where we think, right, that makes sense. So I think, and this doesn't apply to forecasts. I think it's any area, different companies, different publishers have their own areas of expertise that they can apply to evaluating whether that's a commercial success or not. Um, so yeah, researching the publisher is really important. Having different versions of the deck is very important. Yeah, I suppose that. Do you expect the the developer pitching to have a that sort of precision understanding of what your internal capabilities are? Or is that something that you're happy enough to explain to them in the process of pitching? Well, I always explain when we're pitching, but you know, every every company is different. And every every different company has different resources, and I'm sure the others can talk about that some more as well. Yeah. Well, look, I, I'd like to just because I know we're, 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 the time is ticking by and I do want us to kind of cover this whole process. So the, the question that kind of is raised in my mind is we're talking about the pitch deck here. Obviously, this kind of follows onto a meeting. It's like the bedrock of the meeting in some ways. I mean, what, what do you want to happen in that meeting that isn't in the pitch deck? I think, was it you, Zach, saying you want to leave some room for conversation there? I mean, is that... Is that just kind of just to get to know the people behind it? So it's not just a series of demands and numbers on a two-page document? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons really for, for that sort of conversation. One is um, for me, I think most importantly is that this is a partnership and it is really, it's really, really important to understand that any developer should be looking for a partner and a partner that fits and it should be mutually, uh, you know, should fit all around and everyone should be working towards that. So. For that to, to be possible, um, much like Troy said, he sort of talks through how his company, how, how his company kind of does stuff. We, we do the same. So for us, it's an opportunity for us to explain kind of what we do, how we do it, and what, what people can kind of expect and, and why we think what we do is really great. Uh, and then also at the end, it's a really good opportunity to ask some questions and to dig into some of those areas where, you know, we're going to need to know certain pieces of information and so that we can go back and, and at the end of a of a, of a busy event, uh, evaluate all the different games and, 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 you know, sort of work out which ones we want to be following through to the next stages. So, you know, for us, being able to ask those questions and just dig in that little bit better is, is also really, really useful. So, so the conversation is, 
is is vital for me personally. I think that there's there's you know room to have that because it's twenty minutes is so short. It's such a short window of time to to be able to kind of dig into it. It's um it it's really important that it doesn't take up the full the full period. Yeah. I mean, I know we have got questions building up from the audience. So if anyone has any kind of thoughts on what they kind of want to see from the actual meeting stage and potentially if there's anything that, that kind of developers and pitchers commonly get wrong at that, at that point in the way they approach that, that coming together. I think for me, um, having been on both sides of this as well over the years, um, you know, I think for me, one thing that's really important is to actually ask questions to the person you're pitching to and you know as has already been mentioned on this panel you know understanding what it is that the publisher or the investor is looking for is really important and I think you know starting that two-way conversation rather than just treating it as a time just to kind of convey all the information is, is really important because I think that starts a conversation um it starts to build that kind of relationship and it, it you know it it shows that you're trying to build a partnership um you know and I think that's really important and um also I would say you know, don't get caught up in too much detail. It doesn't happen that often, but sometimes, you know, developers are so excited about the design of the game that they can go off track and talk for, take up 10, 15 minutes of the session just talking about a very specific design and then you run out of time to talk about the other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I, th I, think, I think that's cute, though. I'd I, I, I like seeing that, like, just personally, because, like, it's the enthusiasm, right? They're super excited about it and, you know, yeah. laying nerves and anxiety on top of that. You're just like, okay, cool. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's cute. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you're, you're okay. right. Like, okay. it, you, you can tell the people that are doing it the first time, they're doing it, like, maybe their 20th time. Like, they, like they've like they learned to, like, just slow it down and just keep going. Um, Yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, everyone's right there. Like, you know, at that point, you do want to be, like, probing it's like okay i've seen the technical stuff i've seen the game i was like but like do i want to speak to you every week like you know <laughs> like it, it just because we, we have it like in triple a like you know there's, there's well-established assholes that are geniuses but like their teams hate them and like our team's really small and we're all too old well i definitely am um and life's too short like you don't you don't want to introduce that into into your I'm not going to say it, but like into your team. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a big thing. And um, so yeah, I just want to touch the point that Troy mentioned. So um, yeah, in these meetings, uh, I'm, I'm quite strict to say, right, you've got 10 minutes, I've got 10 minutes, because I think it's very important to uh, explain to them what we can do and what we see our value add at is. And then 100% um, uh, uh, my last minute is just the next steps. So I explained to them, you know, how long the process is going to take and i dictate to them like listen this is me i normally take two weeks to get back to you like if if it's two weeks of one day then you can email me like do, do not like inside that two week window like you're going to be in that annoying zone so just don't do it yeah. um because yeah they can't you know they can't read my mind they don't know that stuff so if you just give it to them they'll be like okay cool and um from our perspective like the pitching we're pitching them too so when they've got their list of 10 publishers, they're like, okay, cool. Oh, yeah, like, Fair Traveler's a really good meeting. Like, I'm going to pay attention to them once. Like, oh, you know, Raw Fury didn't talk to me very much, so maybe I'll get back to them last. Like, people are people, right? And and these kind of, like, soft uh, things are important too. So, No, I think that's interesting because fo following up was one, one question I definitely had was, can you be too keen? Can you... Can you push your luck a little bit in terms of trying to get? Because obviously, because like you say, there's you know people are people, and we want to hear the answers that are really important to us. But if you've been told two weeks, wait two weeks. That would be yeah. seems to be quite a good rule of thumb there, right? So that's that. Well, like I'm aware that we've got five, five, six questions maybe from the crowd. No, I think uh, rather than me waffle on and on, I'd like to kind of throw over to them. So Jamie, um, I think we do have questions to feed through, right? Yeah, we've got a, a few questions. Uh, the first one was, um, how precise should the demographics be in a pitch? Because um, um, there's a comment that uh, Ella said that, um, you know, male 18 to 35 isn't a demographic. So I think people just want a bit of clarity on that. It's, it's too clarity on, on um, yeah, clarity how precise on how the to demographics. define an audience. 
Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, well, exactly. So, so uh, at, a, at a basic level, I mean, doing this is another is a challenge. But what you need to get to is a point where it's a targetable audience, and by targetable we mean you know where to reach them and how, and what to say to them. And so there are different ways of doing that, but that's fundamentally where you need to get to. Now, the way we tend to do it, and this is just one route, is by personas. Um, and we tend to identify primary, secondary, and tertiary audiences, and we define each of those by a different persona. I've seen many different ways of doing it, so, uh, which are also equally valid. Um, but what I would say is that games is an industry like any other. There is not a unique way of doing this for games. These are basic marketing strategies. So go and read any book on marketing and how to define an audience. There's lots of different ways. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and one way of doing that is benchmarking, right? You know, like Des said, you know, data is hard to come by, but you can know with what kind of game you're making, what kind of feature set you have, what kind of unique selling points, where those different targetable audiences are, the primary, secondary, tertiary, etc., cetera, um, uh, might be. Um, so even if you don't have specific numbers or breakdowns, you can break it down by type of game, uh, because you know, we, if, if if a publisher looks at a, looks at a chart and sees crossover between A, B, C, D games, they know generally just by looking at that that you know, okay, well, I, I kind of get that, you know, almost straight off that. You don't have to be precise, but you need to know that targetable audience in terms of gamer, not necessarily age group or you know this that or the other, you know and so forth it's 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 the type of gamer that you're targeting is actually really really important because then a publisher you know that's worth their salt and has the resources will be able to break that down in a great lot of detail it's not my area of expertise you know i wouldn't be able to talk about that in great detail but um i know our uh, analytics team would be able to get a great deal of information from the type of games that it would be directly competing against primary and secondary etc yeah yeah um just one thing to add to that actually um which is just that uh, uh it said it's, it's one way of the benchmark it definitely against other games and I, we always do that within the personas but actually the other things to look at and new zoo recently did a a new breakdown of gamer types i don't think it's perfect and it's not kind of a an answer in itself but i do think it's quite interesting because what they've done is they've moved away from the completely useless cliches of casual gamer, hardcore gamer. And they've actually tried to start defining gamers. I think it's eight different categories. And, and, and it's an interesting place to look as a, to get an idea of where to go. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Just I think it, there's actually um, um, a really good um, gamesindustry.biz presentation that we did at the last investment summit by Cassie Curran as well from Wings, uh, where she mm -hmm. talks about uh, how to research the market. So if you want to know a bit more about what to put in your pitch, uh, do check that out it's on the youtube channel um okay the, we had another question that's slightly on kind of demographics and kind of data and stuff on on how do you get data on emerging markets mm. and what should you put in your pitch you know should there should there be stuff on on that well why well, like I, unless you're sorry there's you go well, no, no. It, 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 so for me, it's just about, um, again, it's a method behind the madness. So, like, if you've got any public data point, um, that's going to be important, right? Because, like, sometimes it is going to be finger in the air. You're like, well, it's like, well, oh, this report sounds okay. But then if you've got the same data in three different reports, then you've got correlation, right? So you're like, oh, okay, well, this is what I think. Um, and then, I mean, the emerging markets is difficult because there's loads of factors like... Um, you know, credit card penetration and hardware, pen like all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's definitely another thing. And um, just about hardware. So be very careful with using hardware as a target market because um, whatever you come up with won't be true. Because say there's 100 million PlayStations, that is not your addressable audience because the majority of PlayStation players play two games a year, uh, FIFA, Call of Duty. None of them play your indie games. So... <laughs> the addressable market out of 100 million is probably about three so it, just be very careful with the numbers that you choose um and, and and you know how you will that down to be relevant to what you're trying to pitch yeah so in addition to that so, you know you, you mentioned new new zoo um they and other similar companies 
um, do have some very good data points. Again, you know, what is your addressable market size within that? You know, you've got to have some caution. Yeah, in terms of emerging markets as well, I do think that there's a huge amount there. Um, there, there are very big differences between demographics and, and personas, which we're talking about here in emerging markets, because the thing with emerging markets is, yes, you can make a game that, that perhaps will resonate in a certain market, and that's fantastic. But the truth is that the publisher is also going to have a very uh, big part to play in terms of where those markets are targeted and how they uh, and how much they resonate. Does, does that publisher have the ability to uh, market in and do they have experience marketing in different territories as well so I, I think there's a there's there's maybe a lot more to, to kind of look into when we're talking about kind of emerging markets there yeah you know I, I lived in Shanghai for 14 years and I still can't make sense of it so. <laughs> <laughs> Matt we're sort of coming to the end of it now we've got a couple of minutes so do you want to add anything or ask the panelists just one last yeah, question well, I, thought, I thought I'd ask like one last question because you know whenever you host a panel the, the title of which kind of implies negativity straight away i do become concerned that you kind of put people off by just raising all these hurdles in front of them i just wondered like as people who've listened to many pitches and probably made pitches yourself can can failed pitches still teach you something valuable about your game can they still sort of arm you to, to better move forward. I know that's a very vague question and interpret it, you know, however you wish, but I feel like even in that sort of failure, even in not getting over the line, how, how do you help people to learn more? Well, failed pitches aren't necessarily a failure as such. And it's worth taking some of these meetings sometimes because even if you're not going to work with them on this game, the next or the next after that, they might have a hit in their pockets. And it just reminds me of myself working at a small studio in Derby back in the early 90s. We probably made 15 games, which, you know, broke even before having a hit. 20 games, probably. So, you know, as long as you believe in what you're doing, the industry that you're in, and the desire to, to, to keep going and keep learning, you will get there somewhere at some point. So, you know, my lesson on that is you, you never give up. You always take a learning uh, lesson from every pitch you do, failure, success. You draw from it. You improve the next time. Yeah. I also think that you get two, you get two benefits from it. The one is, is obviously you start pitching. You learn what your pitches need. You learn, you know, how to pitch what other information you might need, and then the next pitch is better, the next pitch is better, and you continue to do that, and that's fantastic. And the other one is you build your network as well. You meet more people, you know what they want, you, you, you're you able to go back out and reach out to them. The amount of people that you know I see that I've, I've spoken to before, the amount of friends I've made in the industry because I've, I've, been, I've been around talking to them, you know, it's, it's, it, it's always, I, I imagine it's always a daunting thing to kind of go out there and pitch at the first times, but it's so, so important to go out there and 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 put yourself out there with with different people because you will grow in both those areas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I think that might we're be... actually running out of time, so um, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. But um, thanks to everyone, thanks to Matt and our, our panelists today, Des, Troy, Ella, and Zach. That was fantastic. Thank you all. Uh, next Thank up you. at two p.m., we have a talk from uh, Unit Two Games, makers of Crater for uh, Google Stadia. $5 million of investment as a result of attending a previous games industry busy investment summit as well. So it can happen. Uh, Natalie Griffith from Unit 2 will be talking about how she can help you find funding. So uh, until then, thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon.